Good morning. It is good to be here with you today. My name is Adam, and I'm the pastor here at The Point. Uh, As you notice, the cross is decorated a little differently today. Big shout out to Keith and Deanna Farmer. They got married yesterday. And uh, so I gave them permission. I said, this is the one Sunday I will allow them to sleep in. It's okay. Uh, But they they offered to let us keep the flowers, so I thought that was nice. Uh, Before we get into the word today, I want to give you a quick update. Many of you have been praying for Dell Williams. He passed away this last Thursday at 7.45 a.m. So if you would like to come and remember his life and join in celebrating uh, the faith that he had and the hope that we have in Jesus, we will be doing a celebration of life this upcoming Wednesday at 4 o'clock. Um, following the service, there will be a receiving of friends and family until about seven. So if you can't make it at four, but you still want to come by to show Michelle or Tiffany your love and your support, um, please do so. With that, we are a people who every single week we orient our lives around this book, the Bible. Uh, we are a people who believe that these pages and this book contain more than just words but actually the words of God. Words of God inspired by him, written by man. Words of God that teach us not only about his goodness and who he is, but words of God that teach us about how we draw near to him, how we find him in the midst of our pain and our sorrow and our suffering, how we experience his goodness when life is really tough. We are a people who believe these words contain in them Life. But how often do you stop to think about where this book comes from or why we even have it? See, what makes this book remarkable is we don't believe that God divinely spoke it into being. Like Muslims, for example, the Quran is something that God spoke to Muhammad and he had to simply recite word for word exactly what God said. Or For some people, like Mormons, God handed down these golden tablets and said, translate. And then once they were translated, took them up again. But we don't believe this book is something that God gave in that same way. Rather, our God came through history to work in ordinary means, to inspire over 30 different authors over the course of 1,600 years to tell one consistent narrative, the story of God at work in this world, creating, redeeming, restoring, the story of a God who is with us and for us always, of a God who's not only with us and for us, but who had come down to lay down his own life so that we might live. God worked in ordinary means through ordinary people to do something extraordinary. No other book can lay claim to 1,600 years of authorship and still a consistent story. But this book is even more than that. You see, for a lot of history, for most of history, this book wasn't a thing. And there were only a handful of scrolls in which you could find the words of this book even on. And those were often in the possession of priests and scribes and religious leaders. And so if you wanted to hear these words, if you wanted to know the life that was therein, you had to go to be with those scribes and those priests and those religious leaders. And you had to hear this word spoken over you over and over and over again. And in a culture that relied on the oral storytelling, people would hear these words spoken and commit them to memory. Not because they'd read them or carried them around on a flashcard in their pocket, but because they believed these words were that important. And when it comes to the actual scrolls being handed down, they were incredibly meticulous in how they transcribed and copied them. In fact, for the entirety of the Old Testament, whenever they would finish copying a book, at the end of the book in Hebrew would be a letter and a number. And that number on the end of the scroll was the middle number of letters. So they would go back and they'd count every character. 
And that letter was the one they were supposed to find in the middle. And if they copied the book and they didn't match, they would burn it and start over new. Could you imagine spending days or weeks handwriting something only to realize you were off by one letter and now you got to burn it and start over? They were incredibly meticulous in how they handed these words from one to the next. So much so that we have thousands of manuscripts, some of them dating from the early like 40s and 50s AD. 20, 30 years after Jesus, we have fragments of paper with these words on them. In fact, if you didn't know this, uh, do you know Christians literally invented books? Because prior to Christians coming along, everything was written on scrolls. And if you've ever used a scroll, it's kind of difficult to find the place you're looking for. You've got to unroll a whole bunch. You've got to roll it back up. And Christians said, how can we share this word quickly? And, and the earliest copies of books that we have in pressed form held together sort of like we have today was of the first four Gospels. This book is incredibly important to us, but for most of history, we never had it. So the the people of God relied on those who would speak it and teach it. As they began to build buildings like this one, they would put artwork in the windows and on the walls, and the artwork was intended to help teach that message that they would hear from the priest or the pastor. The artwork was intended to communicate those very words in visual form. But still, up until the 1400s, nobody had this book. And only a few had scrolls. And then along came this thing called the printing press. And it totally changed our world as we know it. The very first book ever printed in that form where they didn't have to manually write everything out any longer was the Bible. And that began a revolution. This Bible now is the most printed and sold book in all of history. Translated into more languages than any other one book. This Bible is available in Dozens or maybe even hundreds of different forms and translations and images on the front. You could even customize your own. Like this one was from a youth conference I went to and they customized the front of the Bible, right? So you would always remember that conference. But the words inside are the same. And now this Bible, these words that we believe are God's words to us and for us. God speaking life into us. These words are so readily available that I just am curious, how many of you have more than one Bible per person in your household at home? How many of you have like two or three or four decorative Bibles that you don't ever open, but they're meaningful because somebody you care about once read them and had them? Or maybe your personal Bible you really care about, but if we're being honest, there's a pretty thick layer of dust on the top of it. It looks really nice on your nightstand. Maybe you've marked a few things in there to show that you sometimes read it. Or maybe the spine's hardly been broken. You see, because we live in an age where this is so prevalent and so available and we can have it at our fingertips, unfortunately this, for most of us, has lost the power that it could be, or should be. See, we begin to read this Bible. We begin to read these words, and we find ourselves really challenged because the words inside of here don't fit with the narrative we live. We find ourselves sometimes not really liking these words all that much. And and so we read Genesis and these stories of God creating, and we find ourselves saying, that's really good, that's a great story, but you know what, I value science a whole lot. I don't really need that. And, And then we get a little further into this book, and we get to Leviticus, you ever been there? And when we get to Leviticus, we're like, these are all laws, and I don't need the law, I have Jesus, and so just like that, we take it out of our Bible, Then we get a little further and we get to numbers. You ever read numbers? There's a lot of names. 
all kinds of stuff. So we don't really need that in our Bible, do we? Let's just get rid of it. And, and now I don't think most of us are ripping it out of our Bible, but we skip over it. We ignore it. We never take the time to be in it. Then we get a little bit further and we get to the prophets. And we'll keep some of the prophets. At least the prophets that we see on Facebook. You know, like the good ones, the encouraging ones. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans of hope and prosper. We'll keep that one. That makes for a great, great quote. But the other prophets... The prophets that speak words of God's anger or his hurt or his frustration, we don't need or want any of those, do we? Because our God is a good God. Let's just ignore that part. And we get to the end, and we see in the New Testament stuff that is challenging, where sin is called out and we don't like it. We say that's Old Testament stuff. Or that's then, that was their culture, our culture, however, we don't need that. And while we might not tear it out of our Bible, we ignore it or avoid it. And when we're done, all that's left of this word of God is very little. And we're left often with a very shallow faith. One in which we believe all the good things about God. But anything uncomfortable or challenging or that might require of me a change in the way I think or the way I live or the way I treat people who cut me off in traffic. Anything that might ask of me something I don't want to give. We just set it aside and avoid it. And this word, God's word to us, becomes empty. Today, as we look at this word, the people of Israel are wrestling with that problem. You see, the people of Israel, the people God gave this word to, and the promises therein, the people who were called to be his children and to be his people, the people who he promised he would bless and multiply, and through them the whole world would be blessed. They took it all for granted. They lived their way, not his way. They did what they wanted, not what he wanted. And in doing so, they neglected his word. And they were sent into exile. And at the end of that exile, they were brought back together. And in this life after exile, in Ezra and Nehemiah, these two books, the people are trying to rebuild what does our life look like after that? Now what? And in this rebuilding, one of the key themes of Ezra and Nehemiah is the role of God's word in shaping our life. The role of God's word, not just being something we find comfort in, but something we surrender to, something we live by, even when it's uncomfortable. And even when it's unpopular, Ezra was sent by a pagan king to go and teach the people this word of God. See, this pagan king, he saw the people and he saw the life they were living and the God they served. And he believed that their God was good and powerful. And so to honor that God, he said, you should go and teach people the things that God says and does. In the book of Ezra, chapter 7, it says this about Ezra himself. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. The reason he's the one sent after this time to go and proclaim this law is because he'd set his heart to studying it, to knowing it. And I love those three words there to do it. See, it's really easy to study this word when we choose to. But then to begin to do it, now that, that's really challenging. Because when we read this word, it tells us to forgive as we've been forgiven. It's one thing to study that, but what about doing that? 
It tells us that to be like Christ, we should lay down our life, even our very own rights, for the sake of others. But to do that, that's really hard. And because Ezra had committed his life to studying and to doing this word of God, he was tasked with going and teaching the people what God commanded of them and promised to them. And that's what we're going to look at in Nehemiah chapter 8 today. If you want to follow along in the Bibles in the pews, uh, it's on page 503. If you have your own Bible or a phone that has a Bible on it, feel free to follow along on that as well. Nehemiah chapter 8. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. Now real quick, when we hear the word the law in uh, the Old Testament even in the New Testament, oftentimes it refers to a very specific set of these books. The first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, it can refer to more of Scripture, but that's often what it refers to. And sometimes you'll hear this used as the Torah, which is the law of God or the words of God, the things that he speaks to his people. So they ask him to bring... God's word to them. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. Aren't you glad we're not then? Like, imagine if you were stuck here listening to me for the next four hours. Early morning until midday. And the people were attentive to the book of the law. I have to confess, sometimes I can read this book or hear it read or consider these words, and I'm far less than attentive. I do it because I'm supposed to or because I was told to or because, well, I'm sitting in church and somebody else is reading it. But you know, when they gathered to hear this law, they were attentive. There was something about the words they were to hear that inspired them, that encouraged them to say, "I, I might go to bed a little early so that I have the energy to hear what God is saying. Maybe I'll have that cup of coffee or maybe I won't but I'll be ready to pay attention. They were attentive, eager to hear, who are you, God, and what are you doing? And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose, and beside him stood a whole list of people whose names I cannot pronounce. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, Now, when it says book, at this time in history, it wasn't an actual book as we think of it, more like a scroll. But he opened it up in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and as he opened it, all the people stood. Anybody in here grow up Catholic or like super traditional Lutheran? And when they read the good news from the gospel, right, they have everybody stand up to read. And you're like, why do we have to do these Catholic calisthenics? Up, down, kneel, sit, stand, all these things. What are we doing? Well, it was for this reason. Out of reverence and honor, they would stand to hear the word. Now, when we moved into this building from the movie theater, how many of you honestly were sad that we lost the movie theater seats and the cup holders and the recliners and all that? Like, we have to sit in pews. I just want to let you know, pews are a relatively new invention in the history of the church. Um, like five or 600 years, really, that's about it. Before that, when they would gather, they would all stand huddled together like this for however long the pastor chose to talk. So at least you got a pew, right? So they begin to read. 
Verse 6, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, amen, amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, more people I can't pronounce, except for the Levites, I've got that one. They helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly And they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. See, as they were rebuilding their community, as they were coming back together, it became absolutely essential that they didn't rebuild their community in the image of the life they just left. Having come out of exile, out of Babylon, if they were to just go back to what things were like in Babylon, they would have been no better off than had they stayed there. It was really important if they were going to be the kind of people that God had called, they needed to know to what had he called them. To what had he brought them out of slavery and out of exile into this new life and new freedom. And it wasn't just enough to know what these words said. They needed to know what they meant. And so in addition to Ezra, who was sharing the words, they had people who were responsible for helping teach the words. Here's what this means. Here's what we do because of this. Here's what we think or we believe or how we act. And unfortunately, part of why it's so easy to just dismiss chunks of the Bible is because throughout history, in the process of teaching, here's what this means... There have been plenty of times where people in their broken, sinful state have misused these words to abuse and neglect and condemn, to justify all kinds of evil and terrible decisions. And so because of that, we say, well, clearly the word itself must be a problem, as opposed to maybe the people were the problem and the ones who taught them were the problem. And maybe instead of saying because of those abuses, we should neglect this, we should say because of those abuses, we need this all the more. To say how should it be? How could it be? What now? But then it continues. Verse 9. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. See, in hearing these words and understanding what they meant, all the people were weeping. And we don't know exactly why they wept but maybe they were weeping because of just how much they had forgotten. Maybe they were weeping for a whole life lived in exile, not honoring the things God commanded or the things he promised, not believing his goodness, but instead that he was against them. Maybe they wept because these words, when we take them seriously, will convict you and me. The truth is, when we say come as you are, It's because not a single one of us will ever come with everything right and put together. If you ever find a perfect church, don't join it. Because the moment you do, you will ruin it, I promise. The truth is these words reveal to us that we are nothing apart from God. We were made in his image, but we exchange that image for something in our own likeness. Something that felt good to us or seemed right to me or seemed good at the time. And by exchanging that, we lost everything. And when left to our own devices, we will only become more evil and more corrupt. When left to try to fix it or do more or get it right or try harder, we will never measure up. Because for every one of us, our natural desire is to take that which is uncomfortable or confusing or challenging and just set it aside. I don't need that. So the people are weeping as they hear this word. 
But Nehemiah and Ezra, they say, today is holy. Holy, if you're not familiar with that term, it means set apart. Today is unlike those other days. The reason the day was holy, because it doesn't matter what you've done in the past or what you've believed or known or thought to be true. What matters is when these words begin to get into you, it changes you and you move from who you are and how you came in to who God made you to be, someone altogether different, set apart, set apart from this world to love your enemies, to pray for those who persecute you, to care for the sick and the hungry and the poor and the hurting, set apart to give up those things that are distracting you from God's goodness, those lies that you're holding on to, to say, I will submit to your truth, even when it's not yet my truth. So Ezra and Nehemiah, they declare, this day is holy. Then they said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord and do not be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. I love that. Because you now are hearing God's word, because you now are receiving what he says, because you're now not only hearing it, but being equipped to go and do it because of this. Go and have a party. Eat the fat, grill the steak, have the good time, celebrate. Because what was is no longer. Now you have the full goodness of God. Not only this, but they prepared food for those who had nothing. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. When we gather together as a community, holding this book to be more than just pages printed on paper, more than just words that we think might be good advice or solid uh, understanding, when we hold this to be something that changes everything, it's a day of great rejoicing. For all that was, is no more. Here in a moment, we're going to receive communion, and there's this promise in Scripture this promise that these words aren't just stagnant on paper. They're not just something that were in the past. They're living and they're active and they're like a double-edged sword. They pierce through the darkest of moments and the greatest of hurt and sin and sorrow. And these words, because they're living and active, these words became flesh and made their dwelling among us. We know that to be Jesus. So here in a moment as we celebrate this meal that he himself has given to us, we get to come before God and confess our grief. I have not always taken your word seriously or submitted myself to it or committed it to my heart to be something I know and I do. But even still, you have given yourself for me. And we come with our grief and with our joy, repenting of the ways we've fallen short and celebrating his goodness that no matter how far we've been or where we've come from or even what today or tomorrow or the next day holds, no matter what, he is good and he is here for you, for me, for every one of us who's broken and in need of a savior. Will you join me in prayer? God, we confess, sometimes we don't take your scripture seriously. We don't take this word as something meaningful or powerful or even true. God, we confess that sometimes it collects dust on our shelf while our life falls apart. God, sometimes living for ourselves, doing what we want, seems more desirable 
So we ask God today for a new heart. Give us a renewed passion to not just commit ourselves to studying your word, but to begin to do it. God, would you give us today a new energy to say, I don't want to pick and choose. I want the full goodness of God. Even the parts that are uncomfortable or that have been misused. God, we pray that as your people, this day would be holy. That we would celebrate that you have come to dwell with us. That this word is not just ink on paper, but living and breathing and active and moving in us today. Teach us to trust you, to follow you, to walk in your goodness each and every day. Amen.